good evening, saints, or afternoon. It looked like driving over here that it was uh, gray and overcast and almost night. And we're under a gale warning. And uh, the wind's blowing, the temperature's low. And I think um, this part of Florida got annexed to Alaska or something. <laughs> But God is good, and we have heaters, and we have a warm fellowship. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And we're going to look um, at one of, well, I guess what you would call a misunderstood or controversial passage today. And uh, we may or may not revisit it the next time, or we may go on to chapter 11 depending on how we get through this today. But if you'll look to verse 26, verse 26, this is the Word of God. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Our Abba Father, we just thank You for Your Word. We thank You for saints that have gone before us, that have provided us with a view of this passage that doesn't teach that one can lose his salvation. We ask that as we look at Your Word that You would feed us abundantly, that we would hear the soft sound of sandal feet, that we would see Jesus in Him only. We pray these things in His name and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. See, what is this? It says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of truth, you can't be saved. Now, usually this is what you have in the non-sovereign grace churches people will say see you can lose your salvation and you ask them well how can you get right with God well you just come back to him no it says you can't do that so it can't mean that can because not one Christian would be saved if that was the case because how many of us have sinned willfully since we became a Christian and, and enjoyed it too, didn't we? You know, if you're a Christian, you can sin, but you can't live in it and enjoy it. God won't let you. So you cannot have it both ways. I remember one day I was talking to a Pentecostal preacher, and she told me that you could lose your salvation. And I said, you mean if you're, walk, if you're driving down the road and you get mad at somebody because they cut you off and you have a bad thought run through your head and you get in a car wreck and die that you'll go to hell? She said, yeah, unless you repent. What kind of salvation is that? What kind of eternal life is that? You can't have it both ways. You're either cut off or this doesn't mean what she's teaching and a lot of other people teaching. In uh, my experience, I won't speak to yours, but most sin is first degree. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We do it. Now, there, there's sometimes we step in stuff that uh, we shouldn't have or we get caught unawares. But as James says, we're, we're enticed by our nature to sin. So if one has thoughts, desires, intentions, and actions... Contrary to the revealed will of God, how can anyone be saved? This is how false theology starts. There's some groups, the Wesleyans, say there's a second blessing, and right, right with them are the Pentecostal groups. And you ask them, well, if you're, you have a second blessing where you become perfect, they say, oh no, you're perfect in love. I said, no, 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 you can't, you can't have it that way. If, if you're entirely sanctified, how can you sin? And then you've got other people that say that Christians can't sin. 
if they sin, they weren't Christians. What kind of theology is that? Well, thankfully, that's not what this passage is addressing. False confessions abound in the church. But that's not what this is talking about either. Historically, what is the author speaking to? He's talking about these Hebrew Christians returning to the Old Covenant. Okay? Now, there is some information in here that is for us too. But historically, that's what he's talking about. We see last week in verse 15. The Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. This is the covenant I will make with them after that time. I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where they have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. So if you are in Christ, there's no sacrifice of sin necessary because it's already been paid for. And then we see in verse 25, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another in all the more as you see the day approaching. The day approaching, what does that mean? He's talking about the second coming there? No, I don't think he is. I think that could be used to us, but in the context that he's writing in, he's telling these Hebrew Christians, don't go back to the Old Covenant because the day is approaching when Christ is coming in judgment on that Old Covenant system that you have failed to obey. Well, how does it speak to us today? Well, we'll look at that in a minute. But that's something we need to remember. So, we do not derive doctrine from oratory passages such as this. That's a, where you're exhorted to do something. He's exhorting them not to forget meeting together. In other words, don't leave the church. Remember I told you this is not about somebody occasionally misses a ser service. This is somebody who walks away from the church and says, I'm through. If, if he's truly saved, will God come after him? Yeah, he might put him in a whale, hat or a big fish. He might uh, send him uh, to talk to three people about whether he's a follower of Christ, hat he? The Old Covenant, people were not saved by keeping the law. Some people will tell you that's how they were saved. No! They were saved by trusting the promised gospel that was coming. We're saved by looking back to the gospel that has already happened. We see in Matthew, the fifth chapter, and we're going to spend a little bit of time in the gospels this morning. Matthew 5:48. Jesus is exhorting his listeners, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now some people have said this word means mature. This word perfect, but we've already gone over this, but I'll repeat it. This does not mean become mature because God doesn't mature. He's perfect. He doesn't have to mature. So he's not talking about becoming mature. He's talking about being like God, which is perfect. And one day we will be. But in the meantime, we're counted as perfect, okay? Then we can look in Matthew 7, 13. This is another abused passage. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate, or narrow is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. What does that mean? How many times have you been told, if you, if you come to Christ, you've got to live it. If you don't live it, you're disobeying that verse. That's not what that verse is talking about. Who is the gate? I want you to think about that. And uh, let's drop down to 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. How many times has that been taken? You've got to do, 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 do. I'm not talking about that either. Many will say, because look, look what he says next. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Prophesy. Did we not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? And they're saying, man, look how good, good I am. Look all the good stuff I'm doing. How can God tell me I can't come into heaven? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you evildoer. So what is he talking about? Well, I could give you... Uh, some, some information, but I want Jesus to tell us what he meant by this. Look in John 10, verse 7. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the gate for the sheep. What did he say in Matthew? Enter the narrow gate. Who's the narrow gate? Jesus. That means we keep our eyes focused on Jesus and not on what we are doing. The broad way is, Lord, Lord, did I not? And he says, depart from me. The narrow way says, depart from me. I never knew you. And he's saying here, I am the gate for the sheep. Look at verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. That means we come through Christ and trust His doing. Not ours, did we not? We don't trust that. We trust what He has done on our behalf. And then we see in uh, verse 11, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. I am the Good Shepherd in verse 14. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Then He goes on to say in verse 11, I'm sorry, Verse 15. I'll get it right in a minute. I lay down my life for the sheep. The Father knows me and I know the Father. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen and I'm going to bring them also. He didn't say he was going to try to bring them. He said he's going to bring them. All Jesus is saying here is he is the way. We see in chapter 14 verse 6 I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How's that different from Lord, Lord, did I not? And see what these Jewish Christians were in danger of was going back to the let's do this instead of it's been done for me. Let's do this. Let's return to that. There's a temple. We don't see any temple here in Christ. Christ is a temple. And we are the stones making up the temple. He says, the high priest. Where's my high priest? Where's my Aaronic high priest with his robes and everything? No, no. Christ is our high priest. Instead of the promised land, He gives us the whole world. The whole universe is His. Why do we want to go back to the types and shadows. Then in verse 4 of Romans, he says, What shall we say to Abraham, our father, according to the flesh discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified in works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. If you've got a bunch of good works, you can brag about them, but not before God, because they will get you nowhere except eternal loss. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. He believed that the Savior was coming in the lineage of Isaac. Now it says he preached the gospel to him elsewhere in the chapter, but we don't know how much of the gospel he got. But we know it wasn't do this, Abraham, and I'll reward you. No, he said, believe in me and I will reward you. He goes on to say this, to the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly. Are you ungodly? When you went to school, did you have uh, the A students and the B students and then my friends? <laughs> yep. Well, God justifies the my friends. Okay. I'm not saying that A students can't get in to Christ, they can. 
but not on the basis of their A's. And we don't get in on the basis of our F's either. D's and F's, whatever. I wasn't a straight F student. <laughs> but I could have worked harder, okay? He justifies the ungodly. Their faith is counted as righteousness because our faith is in the one who's done it for us. And David says, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. Listen to this. Whose sins are covered. Transgressions forgiven. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Are you that blessed man? If you're in Christ, you are. God will not count your sin Amen. against you. Amen. Once we were enemies, as Romans 8 said, but now we're seated at the table. We are in the palace. Once we were drawn to self-exalting, and now we're drawn to exalting Christ. Now seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek that, not yours, not Lord, Lord, have I not done. No, seek His righteousness. Do we want to make up for our past? How many, how many of you are guilty of that? I have been. You can't. What can you do? All you can do is trust Christ because He's already made it up for you. He's paid all of it. And so He bids you come today. He says, all that are um, heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. He didn't say, do anything. He said, just come. Just come. And He will do the rest. Afflicted saints, are you an afflicted saint? You live long enough, you probably are. Are you growing weary? Have you thought that you're defeated? Well, you can't be defeated. Why? Because Christ cannot be defeated. You got what kind of self-esteem do you have as a person in Christ? You have the best. Absolutely. We cannot and we are not defeated. Christ came to snatch defeat and bury it. And he has been and is exalted higher than all by doing this. Saint, he's your righteousness. All your righteousness is in him. I was debating a girl one time on Facebook, and she said, You must be one of those that believe Jesus paid it all. I said, Hallelujah, I don't have a chance. <laughs> if he didn't. So we point others to him and not to, Look what I've done, God, for you. And we've all done that. I mean, I have, so I, if you've got the same kind of nature i got, I'm going to accuse you of it too. The one with faith in Christ will persevere. Okay, back there. The 10th chapter. Um, let's see. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Like picking up sticks on the Sabbath. Uh, like taking some silver and a, a nice set of clothes and hiding them in your tent after Jericho. And he says, with two or three witnesses, these people died without mercy. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know Him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. The Lord will judge His people. It's a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. So what is, is He saying here? If in the Old Covenant and you were given these outward things to do and you didn't do them and there were two or three witnesses, you could be put to death for certain things. Other things there were other punishments for. So he's saying, eternally speaking, if now you've been offered the Son of God by grace, by trusting in Him, and you trample that on your foot, how much worse do you think your punishment's going to be? It's not going to be a stoning of death. It's going to be eternally lost in a place called hell that burns forever and ever. 
And he says, God will judge His people. Now what does that mean? Has God judged you? Yes, in the person of your substitute, right? And those that were not judged then will be judged in the future, right? And they will fall into the hands of the living God. Christ is our redemption, saint, our reconciliation, and our holiness. Your name is engraved, as Isaiah 49, 16 says, in the hands of Christ. And it can't be taken out. And your name is engraved in His heart as He prayed for you the night before He was betrayed. Or the night He was betrayed. The night before He went to the cross. You can draw near now, saint, and trust and rest in Him. Well, you, or what, what's your status? Are you unsure about your status? Well, Peter has something to that. 2 Peter 1.10 Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. How do you do that? You look to Christ. You don't look to your election. Look to Christ. Look to Christ today. We're told in Isaiah 45, look, 22, look to me and be saved. This is God speaking through Isaiah to the children of Israel. Look to me, Israel, and be saved. All the ends of the earth look to me and be saved. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. The word will not be revoked if you look to Christ for your salvation. The promises of God are not taken away. That's what it says in Romans. Before me every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And you can do that in this life and spend an eternity with Christ or you can do it in the next life and spend an eternity apart from Christ. What about this man, Christ? Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place Hallelujah. and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus there is no other name whereby one can be saved but the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I would leave you with this. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with every good thing for doing His will, and may He work in us what is pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.